Morning, Moraine. Our God is worthy of praise. And thank you, choir. I have to... Uh, I have to confess before I start preaching, I'm a little bitter about the choir. I uh, tried to audition for the choir, and uh, Josh wouldn't even let me uh, present my audition tape to him. So, and for that, you can say amen. <laughs> One of our traditions here at Moraine is the Sunday after Thanksgiving is a harvest of praise and thanksgiving to our God. And Pat asked me a couple months ago if I would preach this Sunday. I'm like, yeah, on Thanksgiving? After he made me preach on Revelation 1, this should be easy, right? But what I want to do is I want to tie this message to the struggle is real. I want to answer the question, how does gratitude play a role in our emotional and spiritual well-being. Actually, gratitude is crucial to our well-being. Normally, I'd tell a story. You guys know I like to tell stories. But today, I have a treat for you. No story. And instead, I'm going to read some quotes from different psychiatrists and psychologists who have done decades of research on gratitude. Many of you know that I read, that's what I read in my spare time. When I'm in my office and I don't have anything else to do, I read these books. <laughs> but as I read these different quotes, these are secular people that have done research into gratitude. And so I want to read you some of the things that they say. The first one is from a man named Robert Emmons. And he's recognized as the world's leading scientific expert on gratitude. And this is his definition of gratitude. Listen to this. Gratitude is a felt sense of wonder, of thankfulness, and appreciation for life. And he explains it is an acknowledgement and an appreciation of things that are given to or done for someone. And then we've got a, a number of benefits that I want to read to you that come from gratitude. The first is increased happiness. People who incorporate gratitude into their daily lives have a more optimistic outlook and are more appreciative of everyday things. As they are less likely to take things for granted, they more inclined to be moved by the little things that seem quite mundane to others. And because their attitude towards life may be easygoing, feeling that whatever comes their way is a blessing, disappointment may not be a factor that greatly affects their mood. Being able to see the bright side of life rather than focusing on a lack is a major factor in improving happiness. Another benefit that's very similar to that, greater life satisfaction. Grateful people tend to be less materialistic and more hopeful. They're also, also likely to be more resilient and less likely to feel a victim when things don't go their way. Being better able to see and to cope with tragedies and crises helps improve the quality and experiences they have in life. Better physical and mental health. I read a lot this last month about some of the physical benefits that they have found from doing research on gratitude. 
It has proven that people who live with gratitude are less likely to suffer from anxiety or depression. It's been shown that grateful people are more optimistic and apart from an increase in energy, optimism has a number of health benefits. And it's just, it's not just mental health, but physical health too. Gratitude has a positive effect on immunity, blood pressure, heart disease, cancer outcomes, pain tolerance, and even pregnancy. Those are researchers that have done studies. There's also an increase in self-esteem. People experiencing heartfelt gratitude and high level of happiness have far greater self-esteem and confidence than those with an attitude of doom and gloom. Being grateful focuses our attention on happier, more positive thought, which helps them feel better about themselves and banishes negative self-talk. They go on and on. Greater resilience, stronger relationships. And so gratitude is something that can help reshape our lives. So I want to take a look at what God says about gratitude. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Paul gives us three commands here. They're not optional. They're in the imperative. They're commands given to believers. And they're in the present tense. They're continuing. And the first one is rejoice, always. Rejoice at all times. Not just when things are going well, but in the difficult times, in the crisis times. We are to rejoice, always. Think about that. What happens when you are in pain or crisis comes to your life, are you able to rejoice? That's the command from God's Word. And then he says, pray without ceasing. To be in an attitude of prayer at all times. Again, when things are going well and when things are not going well. I have a tendency to pray when things are out of my control. When I see my life going in directions that I don't want it to go. But God's command here is to pray at all times. Even in the good times. He wants us to depend on Him at all times. He wants us to seek Him Not when just things go out of our control, but in our relationships. Do you pray, God, make me the husband my wife needs? Or wives, pray, God, will you make me the wife that my husband needs? Or in our ministries, do you just go through the motions? I've done this over and over again. Or are you praying, God, fill me with your spirit that my life might serve someone else? God wants us to be dependent on him at all times. Jesus said in John 15, you can do nothing apart from me. He didn't say you can do a little. He said nothing. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And God desires that we depend on on that spirit that lives within us to do everything. The mundane, the important. So pray without ceasing. 
And then in everything, give thanks. The good times, the bad times. Giving thanks in difficult times is actually an act of faith. It's saying, God, I don't see what's going on here, but I trust that you are sovereign and that you are a loving God. And so we are to give thanks in all things. God's doing things behind the scenes that we don't see. He's conforming us into the image of his son. And so the instruction, the command is to give thanks at all times. And then look at the end of this verse. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We spend a lot of time praying about God's will. If you're single, you're probably praying, God, send me that perfect mate. We pray, we cry out for God's will in different areas of our life different circumstances. But here, we're told what God's will is. We don't have to seek it out. We don't have to pray about it. God tells us what it is. What's the result of this? Pete, will you put up Philippians 4? This is a parallel verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what's the result? The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we rejoice As we pray, as we give thanks, anxiety is replaced by the peace of God. Three areas this morning I want to look at in terms of thanksgiving. The first and foremost is gratitude for the cross. Pete, will you put up Colossians 1? For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Leave that up for a minute. The first thing that we're thankful for the cross is he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Before you were a believer in Jesus Christ, you were under the authority, the domain of darkness. Satan's kingdom You may not even have been aware of it, but you were under that domain. And that authority, that power, was bigger than we were. And so we needed to be rescued by someone that was more powerful than us. That's the first thing we can be thankful for the cross. Second thing, he transferred us to the kingdom of of his beloved son. Two spiritual kingdoms, one of Satan and one of Jesus. And we were rescued from the domain of Satan and we were transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. There is a new authority in our life and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead and put the next Oops, nope. Let me get to that. He also transferred us, and then he, the cross says we were ransomed. We were ransomed. There was a payment for us being rescued, and it was the cost of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. It cost us to be taken from the kingdom of darkness. 
And then we have the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus paid for our sins. Let me read two other verses in that section of Colossians. He reconciled all things to himself. Jesus reconciled us. Our sin had separated us from God. And Jesus reconciled us through the cross. He goes on to say, you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. And here's the result. You want to be thankful to the cross, listen to the result of this. To present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The cross has not only reconciled us to God, but has made us holy and blameless before him. The cross is the place where gratitude starts. We're not the people that we were. God has changed us. He has made us new creatures. We went from being his enemy, from being dead in sin, to be adopted into his family. Ushers, come forward. We're going to take communion at this point. I want you to pass out. But I want you to think on me all the impact that the cross has had on your life. From enemies of God to sons of God. From being dead to being alive. Talk about having an attitude of gratitude. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the cross is where you begin to practice your gratitude. Come forward, men, women. I want you to be practicing gratitude I'm going to give you a couple minutes as this is being passed out. And I want you to practice gratitude. Tell God what you are grateful for, for the cross.
prayed for the bread. Father, thank you for this bread that represents your body that was given for us. You sent your son not only to carry our sin, to become our sin. Father, we deserved the wrath of God that was poured upon, out upon Jesus at the cross. We are thankful that you sent your son to take our wrath, Father. We are eternally grateful. Thank you. Let us eat together. pray for the cup. Father, this cup represents your blood poured out for our sin. Paid the debt of our sin. And Father, it's the inauguration of the new covenant the new covenant where we've got a new heart and we've got a spirit that lives within us. Paid for. Sealed. By the blood. Again, we are a grateful people. Let's drink together. Grateful for the cross. It is finished, maybe the greatest words ever spoken. Our debt, our sin debt, paid for. Amen. Why don't you turn to Psalm 92? We've already said that giving thanks is not only good for our soul, but for physical health. We need to practice giving thanks to God. And that's done most easily when things are going well. I believe we need to train ourselves in giving thanks. And it's done when things go well. So when the crises come, it's become a habit. And so I want to look this morning at why we should give thanks in the good times. One of the things I read in, in these different researchers' work was that journal, journaling is good for us. We are to journal what we're grateful for. I begin every morning in my time with the Lord giving thanks to the Lord. And they talked about how journaling helps us to train ourselves in an attitude of gratitude. And I want to look at Psalm 92 What can we give thanks for? What are some of the things the psalmist gives thanks for? And it's interesting in this psalm, in the first four verses, the psalmist gives thanks for who God is and for his creation. And then as we move down further in the psalm, he gives thanks for what God has done for him. And so look with me at Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. The researchers find out that's true. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. 
Our thanks begins with the Lord. And it begins with his character. Look at verse 2. To declare. The psalmist is declaring something here. Your loving kindness in the morning. In the morning, declare God's goodness, his kindness, not only to his people, but to you. As you begin your day, think on the character of God and how he's provided for you, how he's met you in your need. Something else that the psalmist declares, God's faithfulness in the night. God is faithful to his promises. The other psalmists and other psalms say, you are faithful to all generations. God is a keeper of his promises throughout history. Think on God's faithfulness. How can you be thankful for him keeping his promises? Peter said this. He said that God has given us everything we need pertaining to life and to godliness. And the context of that is his precious and magnificent promises. Think on the promises that God has made to you as his children. And be thankful that those promises are true no matter what's going on in your life. The psalmist is grateful for who God is. But he goes on. Look down in verse 4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Another thing, as you begin your day, give thanks for God's creation, for his works. In Romans 1, we've got another declaration that God's creation declares his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. Creation is there to declare the glory of God. Practice gratitude for God's creation. But then drop down to verse 10. He shifts from God's character and his creation to what he's done for the psalmist. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Pete, put up this in the Passion Translation. I love what it says in the your anointing has made me strong and mighty. You've empowered my life for triumph by pouring fresh oil over me. God gives us our strength. He refreshes our soul by pouring oil on us. God is good to us personally. He goes on in verse 12. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. God will allow us to flourish. We can flourish when things are going well. But because the Lord is the one given strength, 
we can flourish in the difficult times, in the crisis times in our lives because of God and what He's done. And then verse 13, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. God has given us a community to live in, to flourish in, to thrive in. God's given us this body of believers to help us flourish. Many of us, when we come into difficult times, we turn inward. We try and resolve the issues on our own. The psalmist says, God has planted us in the house of of the Lord. Use the resources of God's people to walk you through the difficult times. And then verse 14. I really like this verse. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. I like that one. You know, on a social media, the new buzz phrase is, okay, boomer. You know what? Not in the house of the Lord. In the house of the Lord, God's given us older saints not to mock, <laughs> but to help us see how to walk through life. A community of older saints that have been where we're, all, we're at now, to show us how to get to the other side with joy and gratitude. God's given us old saints for our help. And then he declares something else. The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. This is all about God the Lord, our gratitude, our thanksgiving begins and ends with the Lord. So, now that we've practiced giving good, or giving thanksgiving in the good times, let's take a look at how we do it in the difficult times. And uh, Pete, would you put up Let me get to this. I'm sorry, Pete. Take that, take that one down. We're not there yet. My mistake. I want to, you to turn to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. We'll look at uh, Hebrews 10 a little later. But what about difficult times? I want you to think on those crisis times in your life. How did you handle it? What was the pathway that you took? In Hebrews 12, we've got the example of Jesus. And I want to take a look at this, on how did Jesus walk through the difficult times, the most difficult time. Hebrews 12 2 says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author of our faith, the one that's gone before us and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus perfected faith in his life. And so he's our example. He's the one we look to. And so it says joy was set before him. We're going to come back to that part. But I want to look at what Jesus went through. He endured the cross. the Holy One, the Perfect One, had to endure the cross. He became sin 
The one who knew no sin became sin. Jesus endured that. Never knew sin. And now he's bearing and becoming sin. Secondly, because he's bearing our sin, he's forsaken of the Father. Throughout eternity, Jesus and the Father, perfect, intimate relationship. While he hung on that cross, he was separated from the Father. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For the first time in eternity, Jesus was separated from the Father. He endured that the physical pain of crucifixion was unbearable. Jesus endured that. And it says he despised the shame. He thought little of the shame. He was on a cross as a common criminal. The Romans had devised this terrible Death, not only physically painful, but be to be shamed in front of people. Jesus looked on that as nothing. His own followers were there. They had hoped that he was coming to set up the kingdom. And yet here he is on a cross. And so how... Is it possible that Jesus could have joy in the midst of that? First thing was he was obedient to the Father's plan. Now Pete put that verse up. Look what Hebrews chapter 10 says. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he, Jesus, comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not deserved, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. No pleasure, Father. Then I said, behold, I have come, and the scroll of the book is written of me, to do your will, O God. Jesus' whole life was about doing the will of the Father no matter what the cost. Second reason the joy set before him, he knew that the cross would redeem a sinful people. People that could not come into a relationship with the Father because of their sin, Jesus was now allowing them to enter into. Faith in Jesus is much different than performing and trying to be good enough and then failing. Jesus knew that the Father's plan was the way to redeem sinful people. Finally, because he loved us. Jesus had joy going to the cross because he loved us and he wanted to spend eternity with us. So, what do we learn from fixing our eyes on Jesus? Difficult times come to us in order for us to be changed on the inside. He allows pain and suffering and disappointments to come into our lives. He desires to walk with us, for us to trust him in those difficult times. Romans 8 says it this way, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Not that all things are good, but that God causes them to good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. You are predestined 
to be conformed into the image of Jesus. God uses difficult times to conform us into the image of Jesus. James says it another way, another command for us in James chapter 1. Consider it all joy. Reckon it. Decide. Make a choice of joy. My brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, steadfastness, the ability to walk through life steadfast, not being thrown to and fro by the waves waves of life. Let endurance, that's a command, let endurance, let this testing have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, that you will come to that place where God intends you to be, lacking in nothing. We can walk through life filled with joy because God's doing something in the inside that's more important than what's going on on the outside. The road to maturity comes through trials and adversities. And God desires us to walk that path in joy and gratitude. I want to invite up one of my best friends, Jeff Schmidt. And the reason I'm inviting Jeff up is that he has had a life of trials. Now, most of us go through a couple of months or maybe even a couple years of difficulties. Jeff has gone through a life of difficulties, and he's probably as joy-filled a believer as I know. And so I want you to hear how God brought him to that place. You ready? I'm ready. Hello, church. (laughs) Jeff, can you give us an overview of the last 45 years of your life? A brief overview. (laughs) That's what I thought when he first asked me that question. I said, how do you capsulize all of it into 45 years? But that's how long I've been a believer. And uh, I'm just going to go over a few things. They're in no particular order because I took them as they came into my head. And uh, I'll just start. I had four relatives die in one year, including my mom and dad. My brother died about six years ago. And also in that year, I had a heart attack and three stents. Over the years, I've had more, I've had five more stents, which means surgery. Um, Many MRIs, CT scans, because of, uh, I wore my body out working. Two neck fusions, lower back fusion, many pain reduction shots. Out of work, many times, I don't know how many, (laughs) many car problems, computer problems. I have a paralyzed vocal cord that will never work. Um, I'm on many prescriptions to keep me alive and ticking. Um, I don't like having to take that many, but that's what keeps me alive and going. My bride and I have lived paycheck to paycheck all these years. Uh, It used to drive me nuts, but uh, God had other plans for me. Uh, Let's see, here I've got hearing aids, I wear glasses. Um, The last five or more years, I've needed an ankle brace, knee brace, back brace, two wrist braces, and my cane, and that's all at the same time. Many of you know this, you've seen the fancy cane that my brother gave me. Wow. That's what I say. Do we feel sorry for you, John? Absolutely (laughs) not. Absolutely not. uh, What was your initial response? as these difficulties came into your life, or earlier in your life? Oh, I'd like to say it was joy and gratitude, but it wasn't. Um, Early on, uh, when a problem came along, I would get angry. I'd get mad, I'd get frustrated, I'd cry. 
I'd uh, sometimes yell at God, I sometimes would swear, why me God, it's not my fault, um, can I get a break please? And uh, pity parties, I was real good at those. And uh, I was a mess and I couldn't figure out the Christian life. Failure was the bottom line, I, I couldn't avoid it on my own. Uh, then I went into a five year deep depression where I was functional, I could go to work and that's about it. Uh, my family didn't like me much and I certainly didn't like myself. Everything I tried during my depression failed, even praying and reading the word. I just felt that I lacked so much and I couldn't live up to this life that uh, God said I could have. Um, yeah, it was terrible for my whole family and my church friends because I pushed them all aside. So what process did uh, God walk you through to get you to an attitude of gratitude? That's a simple answer. <laughs> the most difficult thing to do. The first thing God showed me was to stop focusing on myself. All those statements I made were I statements. It was all about me. And I found out that's not what God says. He wants it all to be about him. I'm to be dependent on him for everything in my life, everything. Um, so during those five years of depression, I would quote Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Great is his faithfulness. Every morning, five years. Uh, the other thing I had was a, a large poster of a lighthouse during a storm where the seas are raging all around it and you could see the light penetrating the darkness. That was God penetrating my darkness with his light and was showing me where I needed to be going. At that time I also, oh, after I came out of my depression, um, let me see, I got it out of order already, it doesn't matter. Oh, the other one is, uh, God led me to Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Wow, that had a giant impact on my life. I was always looking back. I needed to be looking forward. And so uh, a number of circumstances led me to begin looking forward. Uh, another verse is uh, Romans 8, 37. But in all these things we over overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. These two verses were critical in uh, getting me back on track. I also at that time after the depression asked a friend of mine if he could help me. I wanted to, do, I wanted to learn more about God even though I'd been a believer for a number of years. Well, he said yes. So we spent a total of four years in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Two years he taught a group I was in, and the next two years he had me teach it. That was another major uh, milestone in my life. It, it changed me completely. I looked at life so much differently. I looked at it as God's in control, not me. And he, I could trust him to have control of my life. And I began to turn it over to him. Uh, through those years, what also helped me is I've been in many Bible studies, small groups, one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Many men have mentored me. I've had elders pray over my wife and I in the midst of difficult situations. Prayer's been answered in so many different ways by so many different people. Um, some answers are difficult. Some answers in ways, whatever. The prayer is what really helped me. I, I said, okay, I can't do this on my own. And the church, the Bible says to look to the church, look to the elders. Also, I have many friends here that have prayed for me over the years. And I'm eternally grateful for that because the body life of this church has seen me through so much that uh, I can be where I am today because of everyone's help and prayer. So how would you encourage those who are currently in the fire? What would you say to them? Well, don't do what I did a few years after I got saved. I was so excited for God. I said, God, I have to be dependent on you. Do whatever you have to do. <laughs> My wife didn't laugh at that. I wonder why. She understands more now. So what I would say 
is what I said just a little bit earlier, the I statements in your life. Don't talk to yourself as, I'm a failure, I'm no good, I'm a joke. I used to do that for fun, but I found out that really did harm me. Don't do that. Uh, look to the Word. The Word showed me that it's all about God. It's what He does, what He says, what He wants, what He will do. Not me. Uh, we are fearfully, oh, negative talk is the lie of Satan. God doesn't make any junk, folks. You're, none of us are junk. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. He sent Jesus who died for us. He adopted you, us. You have a place in heaven. You can reach out to many people, reach out to the pastors, elders, deacons, friends. You may know somebody. Stop me and talk to me. I'd be more than glad to talk to you. That's what I'd love to do. And basically, that's, it's not simple. It's almost impossible to do. But as you practice it, going to the word and prayer, seeking out help, you will begin to change. You will begin to grow. And you will begin to be, have gratitude for God. I'm grateful in whatever happens. And a lot of you know and know now how much I've had to go through. But that's okay. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Take that and put it back there. Let me pray for us. Father, you are a good God, a good Father, even when things in our lives fall apart. And so, Father, my prayer for us, would you change us into a people of gratitude? Lord, you have done so much for us through the cross, through what you've given us in creation. God, you've allowed us to flourish. So we want to be a grateful people that say thank you. And Lord, would you change hearts that are ungrateful? Would you begin them on the journey to gratitude? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.